Hi, welcome to season two of my podcast, All About Her. I'm your host, Shreya Anand, and I'm a high schooler interested in STEM. Join me as I speak to various women in STEM to learn all about her experiences and advice for girls like me. Today, I spoke to a woman who is originally from the UK and has pursued medicine throughout her life. She has followed a variety of different paths to get to where she is right now as currently a clinical professor at Stanford University under the field of obstetric anesthesiology. She also performs a bunch of different simulations as a part of her job, which are incredibly fascinating and show a brand new age of technology in the field of medicine. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Jillian Abir, and we'll be speaking about a lot more of exactly what those simulations are and what her job entails. So I hope you enjoy today's episode, and let's get on with it. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Abir. Would you mind please just introducing a little bit about what you do and what you currently specialize in? Certainly. Um, so my full name is Jillian Abia, but I go by Jill Abia. Um, so I'm a clinical professor in the Division of Obstetric Anesthesiology at Stanford University in the Department of um, Anesthesiology and Preoperative Medicine. Um, and I've been there since 2009. I started as a fellow, did a fellowship in obstetric anesthesia, and then worked my way um, through the system First of all, um, a clinical instructor, and then a assistant clinical professor, professor, then an associate clinical professor, and then last year I was promoted to a clinical professor. Wow. Um, I guess one question that I really like to ask everyone that I interview is, um, did you ever see yourself doing this when you were younger, or did you have like a dream job when you were younger and just kind of in high school? Yes, that's a great question. So when I was seven, um, I had to have some teeth extracted at the dentist. So I, I trained in the UK and then I came to the US in 2009. So when I was seven years old in the UK, I went to the dentist and had some teeth extracted and that was under general anesthesia. And I just remember as a seven year old having the mask put on my face and just drifting off to sleep and thinking that was just such a cool job for the person who was doing that to me <laughs> so um and I was I just said to my parents oh I think I'll be an anesthesiologist um so I'm not quite sure what they thought at the time anyway I kept I, I just kept that thought in my head my whole time during school and high school um that I wanted to be a doctor um however when I went to med school um in the UK I kind of then changed my mind about what kind of specialty I wanted to pursue a career in. And I decided I wanted to be a surgeon. So I pursued, initially I pursued the track of going down surgical training. Um, so the training in the UK is a little bit different to the US. And at the time it was quite easy to, so this was back in the late night. Well, I graduated uni in 1998. So when you first work as a doctor in the UK, you do general training, like an internship for a year. Mm -hmm. um, and then you specialize, but it's quite easy to chop and change if you're not sure about the specialty. Whereas now it's a lot more streamlined like it is in the US and it's a bit more difficult to change, for example, from year to year. So I started off doing what we call basic surgical training, which initially was for two years in which you rotate through different surgical specialties such as orthopedics, general surgery, breast surgery, thoracic surgery. And it was during that, those two years that I realized that, yeah, I like doing practical things. Like I like being in the OR, but that only happened one day a week. <laughs> and the rest, of, rest of the week, you were doing clinics or outpatient things. And, and I just really wanted to be doing practical things the whole time. So I kind of then went off the, the idea of surgery. But in the meantime, I started doing the surgical exams in the UK, which were quite hard work. Um, and then I thought I would try doing emergency medicine. 
which we call accident emergency in, in UK. So I, I changed and started to do that training. And what became apparent during that training was that I really liked the high risk cases and the trauma cases and sort of high energy cases and ones that get your adrenaline going as opposed to just minor injuries. So in the trauma room in accident emergency or emergency medicine, it's really important to have the skill to intubate patients if they need emergency airway um, rescue. So I then went to train in anesthesiology in the UK, but for airway training for emergency medicine. So when I, when I went to, when I diverted and went to anesthesiology, it wasn't with the intention of being an anesthesiologist. It was just the intention to gain airway skills and then return to emergency medicine. But I just found that I liked it so much <laughs> that I just decided to stay um, in that training. So that's when I just completed my training in anesthesiology in the UK um, and graduated from that training program. I see. Um, and, and one thing that I kind of picked up on was you said when you were younger, you kind of, you thought it was really cool. Like the people who got to, who got to actually, you know, use anesthetics and things like that on patients. Yeah. Um, that, that was kind of what sparked it for you. Did you know that this field like by itself existed when you were that young? Because over here, you know, I, I, I only heard about anesthesiology maybe a couple years ago. And, you know, that was from, not from school or anything like that. So I just thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I'd heard of the field of anesthesiology when I was young, um, but I didn't, I didn't quite know at the time all the different subspecialties within the specialty of anesthesiology. And that's, that's what a lot of people, yeah, a lot of people don't, don't know what anesthesiology is. Um, and a lot of people don't think it's a physician led specialty. In the US there are certified nurse anesthetists, but the field of anesthesiology is led by physician anesthesiologists. Okay. Within anesthesiology there's lots of different subspecialties such as cardiac anesthesiology, pediatric anesthesiology, obstetric anesthesiology, intensive care medicine. There's a huge kind of world of anesthesiology that a lot of people don't really aren't privy to they don't really understand all what's involved in anesthesia care and that's the thing like we, we, we don't just put patients to sleep we what we call now is perioperative physicians so we look after the patient prior to the surgery um, we optimize the patient so that they're fit enough to actually withstand the anesthesia and surgery and then we look after the patient during the surgery then also postoperatively we're involved in um, pain control for the patients, any adverse effects. So we're looking after the whole physiology of the patient. The surgical team, or in my case, the obstetric team, I, I mainly do obstetric anesthesia now. So the obstetric team or the surgical team, they're looking after the delivery of the baby or the surgical aspects of that care. But it's the anesthesiologist who are actually keeping the patient alive. It's a huge responsibility and it's a huge expanse of involvement in different aspects. And, you know, we, we do a lot of practical things. We do, um, we intubate the patients, we do epidurals, spinals, we do peripheral nerve blocks. So patients sometimes have in, for example, a knee replacement will have a spinal epidural. So they're awake during the surgery or with some sedation. So we have lots of different procedures that we do um, so it's, it's, it's not just about putting patient, patients to sleep. That goes for a lot of fields in STEM. You know, I, I've spoken to quite a few women and, and I haven't heard about a lot of their specialties or I guess the, the inner workings of each of these fields, like even in something like math, you know, there are so many different types of things. And I think you're a perfect example of under anesthesiology, which is something that a lot of people by itself don't really know about. There's so much more. It's like a whole other ecosystem, really, I think is, yeah. is how I kind of think about it. Um, and, you know, do you think, I don't know if you're working directly with, I guess, 
um, some more younger people who are kind of coming into the field of medicine as a whole. But are you noticing kind of a shift in how how they're approaching these kinds of um, issues? Because, you know, anesthesiology has been used for so long um, for pregnancies and things like that. And I'm sure you know so much about that, but are, are you kind of seeing a shift maybe in how people are approaching problems um, in medicine and things like that? Um, yeah, I would say that before people are using more, um, more resources to try and find the answer or to understand the human body and medicine in general. Whereas before, like 20, 30 years ago, um, you, would, you were taught by a professor and he had, had a textbook. Um, you, you heard of anecdotes or stories from, from experienced people. But now there's such a huge world through the internet in terms of listening to podcasts, listening to lectures that have been given all around the world that are accessible to everyone. There's online resources in terms of, you know, looking at journals and papers and, and textbooks online as well. So there's, there's a huge, and different, different people are in different ways. So some people prefer having a paper book and, you know, reading page to page, and that's how they learn, and that's fine. Um, other, page, other students will look online and find it easier to read a document online. Um, some people find it easier just having conversations with people and listening. So I think now there's such a huge opportunity for all types of learners to establish the way they want to learn, to optimize their own learning route and to, and to really flourish in a way that they can different to their neighbor, for example. So there's, there's a lot of huge, there's been a lot of advancements in, in medical education, both in high schools, I would say, in, in um, medical schools, in undergraduate degrees and throughout residency. And there's a lot of more, I know there's some of my colleagues at Stanford are actually doing high school programs just to try and um, educate people about lesser known specialties such as anesthesiology. So anesthesiology, you know, in terms of the whole of the spectrum of medical care, healthcare workers is a very small proportion. But within that small proportion, there's such a huge range and diverse group of people working together to try and optimize um, patient care around surgery. So I'd say that um, yeah, the, the way people learn and the way people have been educated and the way that medical schools are adapting to now train students has, has changed. And it's, and it's always gonna be changing because people are developing new strategies, you know, new ways to teach. Definitely, um, and, and you see that I think in a lot of, um, you know, just in college in general, I think as well. Um, and in high school, we're starting to see a lot of that popping up, especially because of COVID, you know, Zoom really yeah. <laughs> made its yeah, mark. Yeah, that's the thing about, about COVID. I mean, I mean, COVID has brought a lot of havoc to the whole world, but it's also, you should always look at the glass half full. There's always, yeah. there's some, you know, good things and positive things that have actually come out of COVID. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and I guess I also want to kind of talk about a little bit of stigma around getting into medicine and trying to become a doctor and everything. So, you know, from my limited knowledge and from everything that you've kind of described about your career and how you kind of got to where you are, it wasn't an easy process by any means. And it was very long and arduous in, in some places as well. Um, and did that ever deter you while you were going through the process? And if it did, you know, how did you kind of push through those struggles? That's a good question. So I'm a very determined person um, in anything that I want to do or, or try and tackle in life. So even, even at the age of seven, I knew that I wanted to do this and, and I, never, I never thought that I wasn't going to do it. But I knew it was going to be a tough path. Yeah. Um, but I knew that the rewards, in terms of um, not financial awards, but just just achieving something that you want to do and doing it by myself, 
Like no, no one can help you. I mean, people can help you in some things, but at the end of the day, when you do your exams, it's you taking the exams. And it's you that are uh, given the degree or, or certificate in, of training or, or in whatever people choose to do. So I just, I, I'm, I'm quite de like determined like that. So I think I'm quite lucky because I don't get deterred very easily. So it was, it was difficult, for example, um, some subjects at university I struggled with. And, and when I did my anesthesia exams um, in the UK, I found those very, very difficult. But I just kept on persevering and knew that I'd get there in the end. And whether it took me one year or five years, I didn't really mind how long it was going to take me because I, I knew that I'd get there in the end. And some of my peers, you know, achieving things really, really easily. Whereas for me, I had to I had to work really hard to achieve what I've achieved. Um, whereas I perceived that some people, it looked like they weren't really working very hard, but they'd get the same results or, or better results. But I didn't let that deter me because I wanted, because I knew that it doesn't matter how long someone takes to achieve whatever they want to achieve, but if they want to achieve it, you know, the end goal, the end result is the same. So everyone's, is that there's a joke about people in med school, like what does the, what, what, what do you call the person who, who came top or the person who came bottom in the class? Well, the answer is, is a physician. I mean, everyone graduates and everyone's a physician. No one knows if you were first, second, 50th, 60th, you know, in the class, unless, unless you tell them. Um, so I think it's just about having that determination and, and try not to let any barriers or negative words that people might say affect you. You just have to um, just look at that end goal and just keep on going if that's, if that's what you want to do. I mean, some people initially have a goal and then realize, well, actually, that isn't my goal now and I want to do something else, which, which is fine. There's no, there's, it's better to, you know, not keep on going if that's not really what you want. But if it's something that you really, really want, then just keep on going and just don't let anything put you off until you've achieved whatever you want to achieve. That's just brilliant advice. I was going to say, um, you know, for, for someone like me who, I guess one of the things that I, that I wanted to ask you as well is like, getting through something like this, you probably need a lot of role models and you serve as a role model now for so many other young people, including myself. But I, did you have anyone that you kind of looked up to that helped you to persevere, like you said, and, and get through all of it? I was brought up in a, in a family environment where um, people, my family, like, we want to work hard. We want to achieve things. That, I think that helped me sort of inspire me to, to want, want to do certain things. But also when I went through medical school and as res through residency, there were professors and other attendings who, who each played a role, I think, in the way I developed my career and the path I chose specifically in obstetric anesthesia. And that's the thing, it's, it's for, and different people see different types of people as role models like for example some people might think the most intelligent professor for example is is a role model for them where somebody else might think oh i really like that person's personality so that's that person might be their role model because like i was saying before we all learn in different ways and the feelings and the um advice that we get from people people interpret that advice in different ways um some people really take on board advice that they receive um other people don't always take on that advice because they think they know better and i think as a student whether it's a high school whether you're a high school student or a medical student or a science stu student or you know any type of any type of learner you want to be open to when people give you advice because they're giving you advice because they've had the experience already. And it's up to that person to either take or leave that advice. But you should, people should always listen and be open-minded and then think for, to them, think for themselves and, and decide, mm, that, that person sounds like they knew what they were talking about. I'm going to trust what they're telling me. Or 
I think that person didn't really have a clue what they were talking about, so I'm not going to take that advice. <laughs> um, so I think it's you know it's really important not to be not to be have not to have a closed mind as people are learning and deciding how to how to lead their lives and what career or what environment to live in, for example. Um, it's it's very easy to sometimes not take advice or not even listen. Mm -hmm. But I would give I want to say to people always listen when anyone's trying to give you advice just always listen and then you can decide oh yeah that was good advice or that was not so good advice so it's 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 quite incredible things that you absorb without even realizing that you might find useful you know in two or three years time it's kind of like oh yeah I remember Jill saying this kind of so it's so just always keep an open mind and absorb as much information as you can every, every single day. Um, I wanted to touch briefly on something that when we initially spoke, I thought was really interesting, um, specific to what you actually do and what you work on is, is these, the high risk simulations that you were telling me about. I think we, we talked about it very briefly, but I thought it was very interesting. Can you explain a little bit about what that exactly is and kind of like what you do with with those simulations? Yeah, so simulation um, is when we replicate a scenario or situation that a patient might be in, and it's a way to practice how we would um, deal with that situation if it was a real live person. So simulation can be done in small groups or larger groups. It can be done within within specialties or what we call multidisciplinary, where we have lots of different disciplines all coming together. So medical simulation has, has really advanced um, quite dramatically in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and one of the leading simulation specialists is an anesthesiologist at Stanford called Dr. Gabber, who, who really like started simulation in, in anesthesiology and has really developed it to a, to a point now where it's used in every single um, medical school throughout the US most likely and throughout the world um, and it's really helped teams really come together not only for to do practical things but also communication so communication is a big element of our lives especially in medicine we have to learn or have, we have to know how to communicate and so the simulation um, really identifies poor, poor communication or really um, is a good example of what good communication can, can be. So a simulation, um, so we use a mannequin. And so I do, I lead obstetric anesthesiology simulation. So we have teams of labor and delivery nurses, obstetricians, anesthesiologists, and sometimes, um, neonatologists, or sometimes we bring in emergency medicine physicians as well. Um, and we, we, we do a drill of a set scenario and we just kind of throw the teams together and we don't always tell them what the scenario is. So they have to work it out as they go along and the, and the situation with the patient might change. The mannequins are now really advanced in terms of having vital signs so we can the mannequins can speak, they can breathe, they can have breath sounds, they can have heart sounds, they can have pulses that you can feel, um, they can blink, they can bleed, they can pass urine. <laughs> so they're very advanced and, and well, there's different types of mannequins. You can have very basic mannequins, which also function as a really good learning opportunity. Or you can have what we call really high fidelity mannequins, which actually are almost like a human person. Um, and we can control, you can give the patient, give the mannequin medication and the heart rate or the blood pressure will change accordingly to whatever medication was given. So it's a really good way to just really practice either common scenarios or really rare scenarios. Um, so that if that situation does happen in a live person, you know what to do. We have what we call muscle memory you've been through the scenario a few times already. So when you actually, if it ever happens on a patient, then we 
have practiced what to do and we can better serve our patient population and improve um, patient safety and patient care throughout. So simulation, simulation is, um, it was developed initially in the aviation um, industry, then it was transferred over to medicine just because it was evident that, you know, the aviation industry is such a high risk industry and for them to practice like we practice can, can save you know their lives can save the astronauts lives and have safe you know return from space to earth and things wow um you know i just wanted to touch on that because i thought that was so fascinating when you first explained it to me um i'd obviously like seen things like that in movies but I guess once you hear about it in, in real life, it's it's a different experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's, really, it's really good. And we and we could do it, we do this all over the world. Like I've given lectures all over the world about simulation and taking the mannequin. So I do I do voluntary work in um in the Balkans, in Serbia and Bosnia. And we we do sometimes simulation there and we, we take mannequin with us and you know, because it's portable. Oh. So it's just it's just really well there's different there's different types of mannequins, some are, are light, some are heavy, um, but it's just really useful just to have that aid that you can use anywhere, whether whether you, whether you have power or no power or, yeah. you know, space or no space, it's just a really great resource. I can imagine, I mean, um, yeah, that's, that's honestly incredible. I think the fact that technology has developed so much and, you know, it can, it can really influence so many lives because of it that's that's honestly amazing yeah very last kind of thing that I always end with is just last words advice I know you've touched on like communication in medicine um, we've talked about kind of how difficult it can be and how you know it's important to just stay motivated um, but just anything at the end of the day that anyone who's interested in getting into anesthesiology or just interested in medicine as a whole, um, if you have any advice at all. Yeah, I would say that, you know, medicine, the application process for medicine is very competitive, like it is for lots of other things these days. It's never too early to think about how can I make myself different to person A, B, and C? Because being a doctor, isn't just about being intelligent it's it's about being able to connect with people being caring being empathetic being able to actually speak to a person human to human um and by have, and to be able to do that you need to have some life experience you need to you know be involved in other things not just not just high school or, or medical related things. Because when, when people apply to medical, medical school, um, you have to have gained a certain you know, level before of education before you can actually be eligible to apply. So once people have, been, have applied and the application has been accepted, at, at that point or later on, we're trying to differentiate students from each other and think, okay, how is this student different to this student? Why should we appoint this person as opposed to this person? If we look, if we think about everyone has the same grades and how is this person a rounded person? Have they, have they volunteered? Have they helped? Have they tried to build their life experience outside of education? You know, have they done voluntary work? Have they, have they had a job? Have they joined any clubs or societies? And if they have, have they, try to be a leader within those realms such as um you know there's different committees and different committees have different roles like secretary or financial person or or chair chairperson so things like that you have to always be thinking how how can i make myself stand out um so that when i apply to med school or um whatever degree or university people want to go to or even if they want to go to university what if they want to apply for a, a job how can how can you make yourself different to the person who interviewed before you or after you um so that at, at the end of the day 
the interview panel should be able to remember you as being a distinct, distinctive person and different to other people. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview as much as I did. I loved hearing from Dr. Abir about these simulations that she's running that I really see as the face of medicine in a new age. I also loved hearing about her journey, of course, and so be sure to go down below and check out her website for any more information that you might want to find. And also like, comment, and subscribe to this channel and check out my Instagram because as we approach a brand new school year, my posting schedule is going to change. So go there for more updates. And in other exciting news, I also have my brand new website linked down below. So check that out for more information about not only Dr. Rabir, but everyone that I've interviewed so far. And as usual, stay safe, stay strong, and stay snazzy. Happy International Cat Day.